Hi, in this session, uh, we'll see the questions of surgery in INI CT, May 2022. Okay, so let's see the questions of surgery. Most of the questions were like straightforward, just for two, three questions. Otherwise, most of the questions are very straightforward and quite simple. So let's discuss our first question. What is the correct volume of the prostate? Okay, so if you look at the option, 20 cc is the best answer. Okay, the correct volume of prostate, although that varies from age to age but uh, on an average it is between 16 to, to 30 cc okay as the age progress like uh, more than uh, 50 year old the volume is mostly between 24 to 28 or up to 30 cc so this is the normal volume 50 70 100 cc that is uh, that you will see if the patient is having bph okay so not in case of I mean this is the volume they have asked for the normal prostate so that is 20 cc. Okay next question state the ground statement for the picture depicted. Okay now this is the CT image they have given. If you see the CT this is uh, the left kidney and the right side you can say you can see there is a enlarged kidney and there are lots of uh, you can say daughter cyst and the cystic lesion so this is basically hydrated cyst or disease of kidney although the most common site of hydrated is liver followed by lung but yes it can involve kidney also there are lots of daughter cysts one picture could be like uh, something like this picture you can see in polycystic also but look at the options so the options are also going towards the hydrated disease okay albendazole is given pre-op that is the correct statement caused by dog tape of gynococcus that is correct leakage of the cyst can cause anaphylaxis that is also true okay if while doing the surgery or suppose you want to do uh, some kind of uh, non-surgical interventions like pair if there is leakage of cyst the fluid if it goes into the abdominal cavity that is highly antigenic and that can lead to anaphylaxis FNAC or biopsy is required before surgery that is the incorrect statement okay, you don't have to do any kind of FNAC or biopsy in case of hydrated disease the diagnosis is made based on the imaging and also you can get the hydrated serology you can get uh, ELISA for a kinococcus so that is hydrated serology that these are the two investigations you can do and you can go straight away with the treatment option okay so this is the incorrect statement and the answer for this question Okay, let's see the next question. Who regarding frostbite? Okay, frostbite. See, frostbite is a condition that is because of freezing of tissue. Okay, freezing of tissue and that is generally seen by uh, the temperatures below 0 degree centigrade. Temperatures less than 0 degree centigrade. So, generally in the minus uh, temperature this can be seen. So in case of frostbite there is ice crystal formation and because of this ice crystal formation there is cell membrane injury and microvascular occlusion can also be seen so these are the reasons why this is dangerous and it can lead to a full thickness uh, loss also okay there is another uh, condition that is trench foot that trench foot is because of the again cold temperature but that is generally in the wet condition okay so in this case uh, if you see frostbite if you look at the options may need amputation in severe cases as I said that it can lead to full thickness loss it can lead to gangrene it can go very deep so yes uh, this is the true statement amputation is required in severe cases antibiotics have no role okay antibiotic has role here we'll discuss the treatment rewarming is not done do not try these are incorrect so option number one is the correct statement now, treatment of frostbite is rapid rewarming although it has been seen that sometimes rewarming can lead to more damage but still this is a treatment rapid rewarming to 40 to 42 degree centigrade Okay, and if there is a full thickness loss, if there is a devitalized tissue, then debridement needs to be done. Topical antibiotics. Topical antithromboxin. And systemic 
aspirin. Okay, so these are the treatment options. You can see the warming is done, antibiotics, topical antibiotics have role and we need to keep that area dry. Okay, so option number one is the correct statement that in severe cases when there is a gangrene, frank gangrene, then you have to go for amputation in these cases. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm not sure about the images, but uh, there were four x-rays were given in the picture and all were the cases of blunt trauma chest. In which of them further investigation is required before inserting ICD? Okay, so see, suppose this is pneumothorax. Okay, so pneumothorax straight away, if it is uh, tension pneumothorax, then first you put a needle, after that you put ICD, otherwise if it is a closed or uh, simple pneumothorax, then you need to put ICD if the patient is having aspirated distress. In case of open pneumothorax, first you have to strap the wound from three sides and then you put the ICD. So in pneumothorax, you have to put ICD, so that is the correct statement. Next, if you see uh, left-sided hemothorax, okay, if they are talking about trauma, then we consider it as hemothorax, not pleural effusion. So suppose this is that hemothorax picture. In this case also, straight away you need to put ICD. Now, depending on how much is the output after putting the ICD, there are indications uh, of thoracotomy. But yes, in case of hemothorax also, ICD is inserted. Now, diaphragmatic injury. Diaphragmatic injury generally at the time of trauma, it does not give any immediate symptoms. So many times it gets uh, undiagnosed and delayed diagnosis is done. So in case of diaphragmatic injury, first thing is you don't have to put ICD and you need further evaluation uh, by you can go for fluoroscopy, you can go for CT scan and many times uh, diagnostic laparoscopy is also helpful. Okay, so in, in this case, investigation is required before inserting ICD. So that is one correct answer. Second thing is flail chest. Okay, in flail chest also, you will not put ICD until unless it is associated with some kind of hemo or pneumothorax. Flail chest, the treatment is, uh, I mean, flail chest clinically you diagnose uh, by looking at the patient. You can see the paradoxical movement of that segment. And the second thing, if there is some suspicion, uh, you can get a CT scan done in cases of flail chest. Okay, and ICD is not inserted until unless there is some other associated condition which requires ICD placement. Okay, so these are the two correct answers in this X-ray question. Next question we will see. 37 year old female, unmarried, Nelly Paris, regular intercourse but not on OCPs, mother had carcinoma at 50 years of age. Sister had cancer at 40 years of age. What will you advise as next step? Okay, so this is a female who is having very strong, you can say, family history, family history of carcinoma breast in mother as well as in sister. So you will go for, in this case, genetic counseling for BRC. Okay, so you have to go for genetic counseling. Although, yes, mammography is required, you don't have to go for immediate mastectomy. There are options. If she comes out to be positive for BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation, then you have options. You can advise her depending on, uh, I mean, the patient's choice. You can go for prophylactic bilateral subcutaneous mastectomy. She can go for chemo prevention or she can go for a regular follow-up uh, where she needs to go for uh, timely self-breast examination, clinical breast examination, screening mammography and screening MRI. Okay, so basically in this question, we'll see that in which cases you will go for genetic testing if you are suspecting a hereditary breast cancer. Okay, so you can say hereditary risk of breast cancer is considered if first thing is if the patient belongs to a particular race that is Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. Okay, there are the chances of uh, hereditary malignancy breast cancer is very high in these cases, so they should be go. Well, they should go for the gen gene testing. First degree relative with breast cancer before 50 years. So in this case, in this question, patient is having a mother who had breast cancer at 50 years and a sister who had breast cancer at 40 years. So the patient comes under this category. And if there is history of ovarian cancer at any age in patient 
or okay so if the patient is having history of ovarian cancer at any age or primary or secondary or first degree or second degree relative with ovarian cancer okay so suppose the patient is having breast cancer and she also has history of ovarian cancer at whatever age okay she is a candidate or suppose patient is a breast cancer and she has a first degree or second degree relative who has breast cancer then also the gene testing should be advised okay and breast and ovarian cancer in same patient the patient is having both the malignancies two or more first degree or second degree relative with breast cancer at any age so if the patient is having either first degree or second degree relatives two or more than two who are having breast cancer at any age then patient or any relative with bilateral breast cancer and if there is history of male breast cancer in a relative at any age so patient who is having any relative who has i mean a male who is having breast cancer at any age so these are some of the indications where you go for genetic testing in the patients okay you'll go for testing of brca1 and 2 gene and if it comes out to be positive then accordingly i mean you'll discuss with the patient you'll discuss with the family and accordingly the action is taken although the maximum risk reduction is seen in bilateral prophylactic mastectomy and after the patient completes the family you can tell the patient to go for bilateral sacting or oophorectomy as well okay, next question 30 year old male uh, with blunt injury to the abdomen there was no blood at the tip of meatus nil urine output after foley catheterization so see what does it tells no blood at tip of meatus means there is no urethral injury although that is not the pathognomonic sign but yes uh, if there is blood at tip of meatus then you will consider it as urethral injury and you will not put a foley so it was not there so hence the patient was catheterized and after putting the catheter the urine is not coming the next best step of the patient in this case is okay so if there is no urine coming after putting the foley catheter it means there is some kind of bladder injury okay bladder injury now bladder injury are basically of two types intraperitoneal rupture and extraperitoneal rupture extra peritoneal rupture although it is more common but in that the mechanism of injury is fracture of the pelvis and the urine gets collected in the perivocycle space and the bladder does not uh, at times uh, it is not the causing the complete uh, you know uh, we can say that little bit of urine is still there and if you put the foley you can see uh, the urine you can see a blood mix urine in that but in case of intra peritoneal rupture the urine goes in the peritoneal cavity okay so urine goes in the peritoneal cavity and when you put the police catheter no urine will come and the patient will have features of peritonitis okay so in that case uh, even if the patient is stable you have to go for an exploratory laparotomy and you need to do peritoneal lavage and you need to repair the bladder generally we repair the bladder in two layers okay using the non-absorbable suture by cream. okay so that is the best answer right laparotomy Next question, this question has been asked before also, identify the specimen shown below. So this is the cut section of the gallbladder showing these uh, cholesterol crystals. Okay, cholesterol crystals that you will see in case of cholesterosis. And cholesterosis is also known as strawberry gallbladder. Okay, so this is strawberry gallbladder. Although in these cases uh, you don't have to operate each and every case, so this is generally uh, many times it is associated with cholesterol gallstones. Sometimes it is just a incidental, uh, you can say histopathological finding of cholesterosis. It does not increase the risk of malignancy, so you don't have to operate each and every case. So if the patient is having symptoms, then only you operate. Okay, cholelithiasis, you will see the stones. Carcinoma gallbladder, you will see a mass inside and GB polyps there will be a polypoidal appearance there will be a growth from the 
um, from the mucosa, arising from the mucosa. So this is cholestegosis, strawberry gallbladder. Investigation of choice to diagnose this disease. So the image was given and image of a barium swallow was given and this is showing a bat tail appearance. Okay, so rat tail appearance or you can say a bird beak appearance or pencil tip appearance. All these appearances are features of Achalasia cardia. Achalasia cardia. Okay, so this is a case of Achalasia cardia. So in case of Achalasia cardia, what is the investigation of choice? Although barium is done initially because the patient will complain of uh, you know, dysphagia, but the investigation of choice is you have to go for high resolution manometry. Okay, so this is high resolution manometry where the catheter you will insert and every uh, one centimeter there are sensors and that will see the pressure, the whole esophagus, the pressure in the lower esophagus. So in this case you will see increased pressure in the lower esophagus. That will also tell about the peristalsis in the esophagus. So in case of ecclesia there will be absence of the primary peristalsis. 24 hour pH is generally the investigation of choice for GERD. Endoscopy is investigation of choice in case of carcinoma esophagus. CCT is generally done later on in case of malignancy also in case of certain other conditions also can go for but in this case in case of ecclesia you don't have to go for any CCT. Okay so manometry is the answer. Next question patient of RTA with grade 3 splenic trauma on non-operative management. Okay, so grade 3 operative trauma patient is a non-operative means patient is hemodynamically stable. Okay, in unstable cases you don't have to think you have to operate in each and every case. What would be the reason for laparotomy on the second day of management? So patient was fine, he was put on non-operative management and now the second day they had to go for laparotomy. So what could have been the reason? Presence of pneumoperitoneum suggests. Presence of pneumoperitoneum suggests a hollow viscera perforation. Okay, so hollow viscous perforation that will lead to peritonitis and the patient can go into sepsis. So we don't have to think about hollow viscera perforation. You have to go for surgery in these cases. Okay, extra peritoneal rupture of uh, bladder. All you have to do is just put a Foley's catheter and most of the injuries will heal. Distended gallbladder has, I mean, you don't have to do any kind of surgery for these cases. Fall in hemoglobin from 12 to 10. Actually, fall in hemoglobin is one indication, but when the fall of hemoglobin is at least like 3 gram from the, in, in, in the upcoming like 24 hours. So here the fall is not that much. It is 12 to 10. So in these cases, you can very well, uh, you can give blood to the patient and you can continue with the conservative management. But suppose this hemoglobin was initially on the first day it was 12, on the next day it is 8 and the patient is hemodynamically unstable. So in these cases, you, yes, you have to go for surgery. Okay. Okay. So the next question. Deep ulcer is presented in the figure. Okay. So if you see, this is a deep ulcer. So they have given options. Positive Trendelenburg test. Okay, Trendelenburg test is done for varicose vein and that is for venous ulcer. Okay, and this is not the site of venous ulcer. You can say this ulcer is at the calcaneum and the venous ulcer is present at the medial malleolus and the lower one third of the leg. So this is not the answer. Absent distal pulses and decreased sensation pain on passive movement of the calf. This is suggestive of DVT. Generally in DVT you will not see any ulcer until unless that DVC, DVT is associated with varicose pain that, then that time you can see the venous ulcer. Okay, so again we are not talking about this okay, because venous ulcer the site is different. Now we have two options. Absent distal pulses and decreased sensation. Now if you look at this absent distal pulses that is seen in case of arterial ulcer arterial ulcer and arterial ulcer the most common site is dorsum of foot okay you can see arterial ulcer on dorsum of foot you can see arterial ulcers on on the web spaces between the toes okay you can see on 
great toe. So these are the sites of arterial ulcer. This calcaneum is not the common site. Decreased sensation. So this is the feature of neuropathic Okay, when the patient is having decreased sensation, neuropathic ulcer, you will see this uh, problem. So that can be seen in That can be seen in cases of uh, like diabetic patient, this is very common. Okay, other uh, uh, neuropathic diseases, you can see this. So, in this case, the answer is decreased sensation. Okay, so decreased sensation is the answer for this question. Next question, the correct statement, I mean this could be multiple choice regarding the difference between the split skin graft and the full thickness graft. Primary contraction is more in split skin graft and secondary contraction is more in split skin graft. Okay, so if you see split skin graft or the thin graft, okay, split skin graft, there is less primary contraction Okay, because they have fewer elements of the uh, dermal component, mainly we will take epidermis and just a little bit part of the dermis and there will be more secondary contraction. Secondary contraction you will see later and in case of full thickness, the vice versa. Okay, more primary contraction and less secondary contraction. Okay, so primary contraction is more with SSC incorrect, secondary contraction is more with SSC that is correct, primary contraction is more with the full thickness graft that is correct and secondary this is incorrect. So option number 2 and 3 are the correct statements in this question. Okay, 2 and 3 are correct. Next we will see 32 year old female on tamoxifen after a breast cancer. So obviously if she is on tamoxifen she must be ER positive on immunohistochemistry for around 5 years she was on tamoxifen. So we need to give tamoxifen for at least 5 years. Okay, Tamoxifen is given for like 5 to 10 years. They say ideally they should be given for 10 years but yes for at least 5 years you have to give. This is an oral drug patient has to take daily. When will she stop tamoxifen if she wants to conceive? Now, the patient wants to, I mean, a uh, patient is planning for pregnancy. So, in this case, tamoxifen is teratogenic. Okay, it has, there are reports which show teratogenic effects. Okay, it can lead to ambiguous genitalia. It can lead to craniofacial defect. Okay, so because of this, uh, this is absolutely contraindicated in any trimester of pregnancy. So when she when uh, she should stop tamoxifen, ideally the answer is at least two months prior to pregnancy. Okay, at least two months prior to pregnancy because tamoxifen has a long half life, so uh, we need to stop it at least two months. Now looking at the option, uh, if these are the correct option and the, these questions are as per the recalled uh, by the students. Must continue even at pregnancy is incorrect, just before and conceive incorrect, no need to stop incorrect. One month before is the best option if it, is, if it was one month in the exam. If it is two months then that is the best thing. Okay, But given these options, one month before is the best response. Next question will be which fistula are more notorious for nutritional complications. Okay, now nutritional complications will occur more in the proximal fistulas. More proximal the fistula, more severe is the nutritional consequences. Like colonic fistula, if you see colonic, if there is a fistula with the colon and the skin colonocutaneous fistula, there the um, metabolic or nutritional complications are minimal. Distal ileal again it is minimal. Okay, we, we create ileostomy and most of the time it is well tolerated. Now, uh, duodenal is the one which is having very severe uh, manifestations, nutritional complications, electrolyte imbalance, okay, dehydration, all these things are very severe in duodenal fistulas or proximal jejunal fistulas. 
Okay, pancreatic fistula is, uh, I, although there are problems, but this can be managed by giving octreotide or you can go again and do the surgery. But in case of duodenal fistula, immediately, like suppose it, it, it happened iatrogenically, then immediately you cannot do a, uh, go and do surgery. All you can do in these cases is, like if there is duodenal fistula, you put the patient on total parental nutrition. Or if possible, you can open up the patient again and do a feeding jejunostomy. I mean, obviously, the antral feeding is better, but if the patient is not fit enough for surgery, then you can very well start TPN. Okay, and duodenal fistulas are generally, these are high output fistulas. High output fistulas means the output will be more than 500 ml in 24 hours. So that is answer, duodenal fistula. Next question, again, this is a bite weak appearance of the rat tail appearance, which investigation is not commonly used for or less significant in the picture depicted. So this is, again, Ecclesia cardia. Okay, barium study, yes, we do. Time barium study is you will give the barium and then you will take the mages at different intervals. You will see that there will be delayed in the passage of the barium from the esophagus because the barium goes slowly. There is increased pressure at the distal end. Upper G endoscopy will do uh, to see uh, the changes because of the ecclesia, because the ecclesia can lead to malignancy also. Both squamous cell and adenocarcinoma are at increased risk. But yes, uh, this is done to see the complications and if there is any mucosal irregularity due to ecclesia. And you will see when you do upper G endoscopy, you will see the food residue. If you try to pass the scope uh, through the lower end of the esophagus, you will find some resistance. Anometry is in fact the investigation of choice. pH monitoring is the answer. That is not required. pH monitoring is done for GERD patients. Okay, pH monitoring is done for GERD. But cancer is being operated. Okay, so this is the image in which they are showing. They have removed this specimen. Okay, this is a specimen where they have removed the distal stomach, gallbladder, the whole, uh, you can say, uh, CBD, and head and neck of pancreas. So this is the specimen of Whipple surgery. Okay, Whipple surgery, which is also known as pancreatico duodenectomy. Pancreatico duodenectomy is another name for this whipple. Now these days there is modified whipples also that is pylorus preserving pancreatico duodenectomy but in this case uh, you can see the stomach, distal stomach was there in the specimen so this is the classical whipple. Now cancer in the stomach we go for a distal gastrectomy or total gastrectomy you don't have to remove the pancreas and the other things. Carcinoma gallbladder, you will go for an extended cholecystectomy. You don't have to remove the pancreas and the CBD. Or cholangiocarcinoma and CA head of pancreas. Answer is CA head of pancreas. That is a classical surgery for carcinoma head of the pancreas. For the body and tail, you go for distal pancreatectomy. For head of pancreas, you will go for this classical whipples. Now cholangiocarcinoma, although for distal cholangiocarcinoma, this is the treatment, whipple surgery. Okay, when it is present in the distal CBD, but most of the time the cholangiocarcinoma is perihilar. Okay, around 60 to 70 percent the cholangiocarcinoma is perihilar, and for perihilar, you don't have to go for this surgery, you have to remove the tumor and maybe a part of the liver or a segment of the liver or a lobe of the liver, but not this. Okay, so the best answer is carcinoma head of pancreas. If they specifically write distal cholangiocarcinoma, then uh, two and three both would have been the option correct options. Okay, next we'll see a patient develop loss of sensation at the boot of penis after laparoscopic hernia surgery, which of the following nerve would have been damaged. Now see, hernia surgery, we can go for open repair. Okay, that is also known as anterior repair. So in this case, the most common uh, nerve injured are like ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric and in case of posterior repair laparoscopy is also a type of posterior repair lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and 
genitofemoral nerve basically the femoral part of the genitofemoral nerve these are the commonly injured nerves but if you see the loss of sensation at the root of penis that is seen when there is injury to the iliohypogastric nerve okay in lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh you will see meralgia parasitica where you, the pain will be on the lateral side of the thigh in genitofemoral nerve again the pain will not be at the root of the penis so root of the penis is iliohypogastric although the injury chances of this nerve in the lap is less as compared to the cutaneous nerve but still given the options and the history that is the best answer next question so as abscess presents as all of the following except okay so as abscess now so as abscess so as is so as muscle you can see the origin of so as muscle is from the lateral aspect or you can see the transverse process and the lateral vertebral body from T12 to L5 vertebra and it gets inserted at the lesser trochanter. Okay, on both the sides and this is extra peritoneal. Okay, this is not in the peritoneal cavity, this is extra peritoneal. So as muscle is extra peritoneal. Okay, so when the abscess formation occurs, abscess, so as abscess can be primary, that is because of hematogenous spread okay, from a distant site that you will see generally in immunocompromised patients diabetic patients IV drug abusers okay, immunocompromised HIV patients in those you will see this primary and the most common organism is Staph aureus secondly you can see in conditions like local pathology like Crohn's disease you can see in diverticulitis, you can see in appendicitis it can occur. Okay, you can see uh, like the pod spine or the perinephric abscess. All these things can lead to psoas abscess. Okay, so hematogenous spread of TV in immunocompromised is the correct statement. Pain during passive extension of the hip. Now, if you see the clinical features, there will be pain basically in the flank area. It will be fever, and patient will walk with a limp. Okay, because there will be contraction of the uh, of psoas, and the, uh, I mean there will be a spasm of the psoas. And if you see the uh, posture of the patient on the bed, there will be hip flexion. And during the passive extension, when there is stretching of the psoas, there will be pain. So pain during passive extension of the hip, that is also correct. Hot spine, that is correct. Okay, what we are left with this fluctuant mass. Okay, psoas abscess generally it does not give a mass. In certain cases, it can give a mass infra umbilical or infra inguinal. So it can get confused with hernia, but this mass is compressible and it can disappear so this is not a fluctuant mass fluctuant mass you can see in those cases when the abscess is well localized and you you can hold both the ends of the abscess and with one hand you will compress and you can see the fluctuation test okay, so in this case you will not see the fluctuation so it is the answer here on the current statement about inflammatory bowel disease okay Crohn's disease has skip lesions that is true everybody knows Crohn's has skip lesions ulcerative colitis is continuous childhood IBD is genetic yes uh, in inflammatory bowel disease especially Crohn's disease it has genetic uh, inheritance there are genes like NOT2 CART15 genes these genes are located on chromosome 16 so this is this is correct statement this is true Crohn's is mucosa and ulcerative colitis is transferal this is the other way Okay, ulcerative colitis is mucosal and Crohn's is transmural, it involves all the layers. And Crohn's is curable fully, that is incorrect. So these two are incorrect. Crohn's is not fully uh, curable. Yes, ulcerative colitis you can cure, but Crohn's you can control. Okay, you try to control the disease as much as possible. You cannot cure this because the involvement is from oral cavity to the 
anal canal so this is not curable most common ectopic tissue found in the methyl diverticulum okay methyl diverticulum we know that in more than 50% of the cases you will see the gastric mucosa okay so there is heterotopic mucosa gastric is the most common pancreatic is the second most common and colonic is also there just in 5% of cases so this is third most common okay so although these three are seen but if you look at the options most common they have also asked and the options there are just two so you have to go with one and three okay option number three suppose they just ask okay what are the atopic tissues found in methyl diverticulum and there is an option like one two and three and that would have been the better answer okay this is the last question which of the following is not a perennial approach for rectal collapses okay rectal collapse there can be abdominal approach and perineal approach. Abdominal is more preferred, but for abdominal patient needs to go in general anesthesia. Perineal is uh, not preferred because there is increased recurrence. In this case, there is less uh, recurrence. So perineal is preferred in cases when there is elderly patient who are not fit for general anesthesia. In those cases, you will go for perineal. Okay, now perineal options if you see here delogne and eltenias. In eltenias you will go for dissection uh, sigmoid or rect uh, sigmoidectomy and rectectomy surgery. Abdominal is generally ventral rectopexy. In this case, you go for like well surgery, Ripstein surgery, and these days uh, there is resection rectopexy also. This can be done by laparoscopic as well as open wound. So well is abdominal. These three are very new. Option number one is the incorrect state. Okay, so these were the questions of surgery asked in INICT and uh, I guess like uh, except one or two questions most of the questions were straightforward. Okay, thank you very much.